Hello, Java coders. Here we go with chapter five, all about loops. Good news, just one chapter this week. Also, it's a pretty uh, simple chapter, I think you'll find. Loops is not a difficult subject, and uh, you already know quite a bit about loops uh, from taking Python or possibly other languages as well. So I am going to uh, go through. Here's our course page for loops. And if you scroll it down, you'll see there's the readings and exercises. And if you open that up, you'll see two zips here. These are uh, each zipped uh, Eclipse projects, one from the instructor with all the sample uh, programs in the textbook in chapter five, and then another set that I made up. And then here's the chapter five document, which I've already downloaded and I'm going to um, go through with you as we uh, cover this chapter. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna put this back on the ebook and here's the chapter five document, which I'll blow up a little bit. Okay, well, you know what a loop is. So it's a block of code that's gonna execute more than once, it's gonna repeat. That's what loops are all about. Well, in Java, there's three different looping statements. In fact, there is even a fourth one, but we don't encounter it until uh, uh, ch uh, chapter, I guess chapter six, yeah, actually next chapter. Here comes Tamika. Yeah, so, so in fact, there are four, but um, in this chapter, we're gonna look at three. Every, looping, every loop evaluates a Boolean expression to determine if it's going to continue or not. <clears throat> the, the cycle of uh, repeating the statements inside of a loop is called an iteration. That's the big highfalutin name for a loop cycle, iteration. And it's, it's actually why it's very common to use uh, I as the variable name when you're looping through, uh, when you're creating a loop with Java. So we're gonna look at while loops, do while loops, and for loops. First of all, the while loop. A while loop, it's, it will cycle as long as the conditional expression inside the parentheses evaluates as true. So, Here's the basic structure of a while loop. You've got the keyword while, and then you open a set of parentheses, and here's a Boolean expression that's going to evaluate as either true or false. If that expression evaluates as true, it can operate on a sig single statement, but most of the time you'll have more than one statement that you want to execute conditionally. And if that's the case, you definitely should use curly braces. We recommend that you use curly braces all the time, even if there's only one statement that you want to conditionally repeat. So that's it for, for while loops. It's pretty straightforward. The one thing you got to watch out for with while loops is it's very easy to get an endless loop or infinite loop uh, by mistake. It's a common error. Um, I do it frequently. Everybody does, and that's quite normal. So let's take a look at uh, the first example from uh, Dr. Liang's re repeat addition quiz. I do have the, um, the uh, instructor's examples uh, installed. I've in, uh, imported those into Eclipse. And here they are. And we're gonna take a look at repeat addition quiz. I think I'll just shut all these down up here. You can close them all, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. If you just right click up there, you can choose close all. And we're gonna take a look at uh, repeat addition quiz. This is the first one. So let's see. Yeah, here's the while loop right here. While number one plus number two is not equal to the answer. So you can see what's going on here. Uh, <clears throat> we're, we're creating two random numbers from zero to nine. That's what this would give you, by the way, right? Math.random times 10 is gonna give you from zero to nine. You'll never get a 10. And then we're going to 
uh, use the scanner class and we're going to ask the user what is number one plus number two and their input will be evaluated and in this while loop here if their answer is not equal to the correct answer uh, we're going to say wrong answer and give them another shot at it and in fact we're going to force them to continue this program until they do get it right or until they shut it down so we'll just give it a try here and I'll, I'll intentionally get it wrong to show you what I mean there. Let's say I put in a three there, which of course is wrong. If I put in a, a seven, that's also wrong. And it is just gonna keep going until we get it right. Or we could click on this, we could click on this red rect, uh, rectangle over here. This little red square will stop your program too. But I'll try to get it right this time. So it shows you how a while loop works. Set a parentheses. And in this case, we have a Boolean expression. There's your not equal to operator, which we covered back in, uh, I guess it was chapter three. Hope you're okay with that one. Let's go back to that Word document. Next one we want to try is guess number one time. All right, let's take a look at that. Guess number one time. Here it is. And in this one, what we're going to do is we're going to generate a random number. Well, what's this random number going to be? What, what range is that going to be? That's going to be from 0 to 100. We won't get the 101, but we could get a 0. So it would be from 0 to 100. So we're going to guess a magic number. We're going to, that's the prompt to the user. Then we're gonna get the user's input in a variable called guess. If the guess is correct, if the guess is the magic number, then we'll report that. But if the guess is uh, greater than the number, we'll say your guess is too high. If the guess is less than the uh, uh, magic number, we're gonna re reply with your guess is too low, as you can see here. So this is, just gives you one shot, pretty tough. Pretty tough guess a number between one and a hundred with, with one guess. So I, I'll try uh, 47. Let's see what happens there. Too low. Not much information, but apparently that was not a good guess. Now a much better program is this next one that we're supposed to try called guess number. This one features a loop, which is going to, it's actually a while loop. And what this one's going to do, it's going to keep going until we get the right uh, number, until we guess the magic number. Once again, the magic number is going to be between uh, zero and 100, and we have to guess it. So um, who wants to give this a try? Here we go. Tamika, why don't you take a shot at it here? What would you like to guess for your first guess? Say again. Uh, 99. No, 99, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Too high. Well, that, Too that's, high. Not, that's not surprising, I guess. 50. All right, we'll try 50. Too low. Oh. So now we know it's between 50 and 99. What would you like uh, to try next? 70. All right, we'll try 70. Still too low. So it's between 70 and 99 now. 85. All right, try 85. You're actually catching on to the game here. Too low. I, I, I can tell. So <laughs> now, so now where is it? It's between what? 70 and 85. 85. Now. Yeah. Between it's between seventy and eighty-five. Oh no, I'm sorry. It's between eighty-five and um, ninety-nine, right? Yeah, yeah. It's still between eighty-five and ninety-nine. So, what do you want to try? Ninety. Yeah. Okay. I'll try ninety. A little bit too low. So now it's I between guess ninety-five. Ninety-five. Still yeah. too low. Oh. Huh. 98. Okay. Might be too hot. Oh, that's the number. That was it. 
You got it with 98, yeah. Now you were catching on to the game there. Yeah. They're, 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 um, I don't know if you watch The Price is Right, but they actually play this game on The Price is Right. The same I should have just went one down because I chose 99 the first time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's funny. You almost hit it on the first guess. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> You might want, maybe you should go buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> well, actually, it's the worst thing you can do with your money. Yeah. Much I'm, better chance I'm, of getting... I'm not a gambler. I'm just so scared of losing money. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. You got a much better chance of getting hit by lightning, especially in Florida. <laughs> so let's, um, there, there is a smart way to play, though. The best first guess is 50. And now we, we've just, it's, this is like finding a needle in a haystack, right? And we just split the haystack in half. So now we know that it, there's one half of the haystack. We don't, we don't have to search in anymore. So now it's between 50 and 100. So I'm going to split the difference between 50 and 100. That would be the next best guess, 75. Now that's too high. So now I know it's between 50 and 75. Well, halfway between 50 and 75 is 62 and a half, but I have to guess an integer. So 62 or 63 would be my next best guess. I'll try 63. 63 is too high. So now I know it's between 50 and 63. Uh, halfway uh, between 50 and 63 would be say 56 or 57. I'll try 56. Too high, aha. Uh -huh. So now it's between 56 and 63. Halfway between 56 and 63, could be like 59 or 60. I'll try, I'll try 60 just to see what comes up here. Too high. So it could be 59, 58 or 57, right? That's all it could be right now because it's gotta be between uh, uh, 56 and Wait a minute, am I thinking about that right? 56 was too high and 60 was too high. So um, that, was a, that was a very bad guess, that 60 guess. I messed up. I messed up on the game because when I got 56, that, that should have told me that it was between 50 and 56. And then my next best guess should have been a 53. So I've messed this game up terribly, but I'll, I'll try to keep going. I'm not playing very well. I'll try 53. Too high. So maybe it's, um, oh, wait a minute. 50. 50 was too high. You know what? I'm going to start this all over again because I have completely messed this up. Totally. I'm going to start all over again. We'll do it right from the scratch. 50 is the best first guess. Wow. Now that's very lucky. Chances of that happening are one in a hundred. Got it right off the top. That's amazing. Very lucky. Let's try it again. I'll try 50. Okay, 50 is too low. So that means it's between 50 and 100. So I'll split the difference, that would be 75. 75 is still too low. So it's between 75 and 100. Halfway would be um, 87 and a half. So I'm gonna try 88. 88 is too high, aha. So now I know it's between 75 and 88. That's a difference of 13. So I'll add like six onto my 75 guess. So I'll try 81. 81 is too high. So now I know it's between 81 and 75. That's a difference of six. So I'll take half of that and add it on to the 75. So 78 would be my next best guess. That's too high. If 78 is too high and 75 is too low, it's gotta be 76 or 77. So right now it's just, I'll, I'll, I'll go on the double sevens, too high. So it's gotta be 76. It can't be anything else. Now, I was able to get it with, I finally played the game properly here. So that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven guesses. If you play this game uh, 
the way I just played it there by always splitting the difference. You should be able to get it in seven guesses every time. And people won't believe that. But if you if you do the mental arithmetic, if, if you if you ask somebody to guess a number between one and a hundred, and you say I'll get it in seven guesses, all you have to do is tell me high or low, and you can get it in seven guesses if you can do the mental arithmetic, which I had trouble with <clears throat> the first time. But um, it um, it'll work every time. And the reason it works, by the way, is is because. Um, Two to the seventh power is 128. So actually you should be able to guess a number between one and 128 in seven guesses. Okay. Hope you're okay with that one. Well, it's a, I guess it's the first game that we've had in Java. If you could call that a game, it's sort of a game. It's a guessing game. Okay, uh, back to the document. Dr. Liang's got one here called subtraction quiz loop. Let's take a look at that one. Uh, this time we're using, um, look, at, here's a constant. Constants are all uppercase. So we're gonna have a quiz here with five questions in it. And we're also gonna keep track of the correct uh, score. So we're going to set it to zero initially. And we're going to set a variable count for the number of questions. Now here's the start time. We're going to time each this entire thing. Uh, System.currentTime millis. That's going to get the current uh, uh, time using the clock, your computer's clock. And um, then we're going to use scanner. And here's the while loop. So while the count is less than the number of questions, we're gonna keep asking questions. How are we gonna generate those questions? We're going to uh, generate two random uh, integers from zero to nine. So this is gonna be pretty simple, uh, single digit questions here. So we should be able to do this uh, quite well. Then, then we're gonna do a, a swap to make sure that number one is more than number two. And then we're going to subtract them and ask the user what the uh, what the result is. And by the way, there's no no need for this word wrap. I'll bring this back. Okay, so there it is. And uh, let's give it a try. It's, if we get it wrong, we'll be re we'll be told that it's wrong. And if we got uh, oh here's here's where we're uh, adding on to the uh, to the count. By the way. And we're going to subtract the end time from the start time to see how long it took. So here we go for five questions. Seven minus one. I'll try to get it right. Nine minus four. I'll get this one wrong on purpose. Uh, I'll get this one right. I'll get this one right. I'll get this one wrong. So as you can see, I got two wrong out of the six. And there's the test time. That's how long it took. It was three seconds. Well, it's an interesting program. As far as loops, though, the whole thing is right here in this while loop. Okay. Hope you're all right with that one. If not, uh, by all means, uh, ask a question. I'd be happy to go over something with you if you like. Okay, you know, we'll go back to the Word document. Uh, how about an exercise? Let's see if you can do this one. Take, take five minutes or so and see if you can print out multiples of seven between 90 and 60 and using a while loop that progresses down from 90 to 60. Now, um, Take a minute and give that a try. Or if you'd rather, tell me what to do and I'll try it. What I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll add it to, to the examples that I have here. So what I'll do is I'll add it to my examples, which is this, what this project is here. 
So I'll call it exercise one. So I'll make a new, new program called exercise one. Capitalizing the first letter, of course, which you always have to do. I'll add the main method. And now in this code here, what I want to do is if we could look back at the, at the problem. We want a while loop that's gonna go from 90 down to 60 and detect multiples of seven and print them out. Okay, but we're gonna go downwards from 90 down to 60. So I think we have to start at 90. So why don't we try something like uh, int num equals 90. Now in our while loop, we could say while num is greater than or equal to 60, I guess, because we're gonna supposed to go from 90 down to 60. Now I recommend strongly that you open a curly brace right away and press enter. And that'll give you the closing curly brace and you're indented, ready to go to type in the code that needs to be inside this loop. Now, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to detect and print a multiples of seven. Okay, we want to print multiples of seven between 90 and 60. So um, how are we gonna detect those? Well, that's gonna take uh, an if expression, isn't it? We're gonna have to use if here. So we'd have to use something like if, num, the current value of num, if when we divide it by seven, the result is zero. That, that's how we could detect if it's a multiple of seven. When you divide by seven, if there's no remainder, remember that's what that percent symbol means. If there's no remainder, we know we've got a multiple. So we'll print out that number. So we'll go with CISO, control spacebar. That gives us our system of print line. In this case, I think I'll print them all on one line though. So I'll get rid of the LN and I'll print uh, the num variable and a space after it to separate the various numbers. Now, I think this might work, but um, watch what happens here. This isn't quite gonna work. And this, this shows the danger of using a while loop. Watch what happens when I run this. It looks like it should be okay. Watch what happens. I got nothing here, but this red square tells me my program is still running. And yet I got no output at all. So what's going on here? I've got an endless loop. Num, num is still 90. And, and of course, 90 doesn't divide exactly by seven. So I've got an endless loop here. So I got to terminate this. And I have to remember, always when you're working with a while loop, you have to reduce the loop control variable. So that in this case, reduce because we're going from a large number down to a smaller number. So we have to subtract one from the value of num Otherwise, we have an endless or infinite loop, which is always a danger with the while loop. So if we give that a run, now we do get the four multiples of seven. Seven times 12, seven times 11, seven times 10, and seven times nine are the only multiples of seven from 90 down to 60. Hope you're okay with that. But uh, so this, this is necessary prevent an endless loop. And of course you wanna look at the next number anyway. We wanna look at all the numbers from 90 down to 60 one by one. Most of them of course are, are skipped because they're not multiples of seven, but the ones that are, we're printing them out. Hope you're okay with that. Any question about why that works the way it does? That percent operator is very handy. Okay, if you're good with that. Yeah, yes. Why did yeah. you put the um, 
your minus sign on your left side and not the right side. Right here? Yep. Oh, yeah, it, it wouldn't matter. Uh, it, it would be equally correct the other way. If if your uh, if the if the variable that you're modifying is not part of an expression, it doesn't matter. You can put it before or after. Not both, by the way. That that won't work. But uh, before or after. So th this would work exactly the same way. In fact, I'll run it just to verify that with you. Very same output. Yeah, I did that on purpose because most of the time you see it this way, don't you? With the with the with the post what we call a post fix instead of a prefix, and I definitely I uh, purposely use the prefix just to make that point. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay, back to the uh, document here. A counter. Counter is a variable that's initialized to zero and incremented. That means goes up by one every time a certain condition is true. You always use integers for your counter variables. And you can count the number of iterations that a loop runs through, but sometimes you want to count other things that happen inside the loop as it's iterating. You can use a counter with an if clause to uh, cause a block of code to execute based on that condition. So um, let's modify that exercise we just did. We want to add a counter to count the multiples. Uh, well, we know there's four. Obviously, we can see that by the way it prints out. But let's, let's do it with code. But if we wanted to count the multiples, well, what we'd have to do, we'd have to create a counter variable. So we'd do something like this. We could say int count equals 0. And that would be our, our counter variable. I'll just put uh, a comment in here, uh, a counter. And then every time we find a multiple, we increment the counter. So that would be inside the if block. So right here, I could say um, count plus plus. That will add one onto the counter. And then after the entire loop is over, that's when you would want to report the count. You wouldn't want to report it uh, until you're finished. So after the entire loop is over, we should be able to print out. Uh, let's see. Um, I have to be a little bit careful here. I, I need a backslash n here to start this print because I'm not finishing the line up here because up here I have print instead of print line, right? So I'm gonna put a backslash n here and I'll say found plus and then my counter variable. <clears throat> and, and then we could say multiples of seven, something like that. So that, I think that should work okay. You always initialize a counter to zero. As you know, you recall that from watching Sesame Street as a young person. And uh, you count, you go up by one, of course. So if we give this a run, we should get the count as well as the values. Yeah, there they are. And by the way, let's say we do it from for 900 down to 60, just, just as a quick exercise, kind of crazy, but just for fun, I'm gonna modify that to 900. Now we might not know exactly what the count's going to be, but the program will do it for us. There they are, 120 of them this time, all multiples of seven. That's one of the reasons why programmers value loops, by the way. Loops allow you to get a whole lot of stuff done with not much code, which is pretty cool. You can get all kinds of work done, all kinds of processing with just a little bit of code. Look at all those multiples we got. Okay. Uh, you can also control loops with a, a special value called a sentinel that you can have the loop watch out for. As you know, a sentinel is like a guard looking out for something. Well, a sentinel in a program is a, is a variable that you're watching out for. And uh, typically you use the sentinel to stop a loop, although not necessarily. Uh, Dr. Liang has one for us called sentinel value. Let's take a quick look at that one.
Uh, here it is, Sentinel value. This one, for some reason, this is then a word wrap. I'll bring it back, make it a lot easier to read here too. Okay, so um, we're using a scanner. We're gonna enter an integer. Uh, here's here's a special variable here. Now this time, this is not um, this is not a counter. This one is an accumulator. A variable that is used to add up other variables is called an accumulator in coding. And in this case, this is a good example because what we're doing is we're going to add the data variable onto the sum. We're not incrementing it by one like you do with counters. We're adding a value onto it. That's accumulation. Now, what we're supposed to do inside this while loop is we're going to um, ask the user to enter integers. And apparently, it's going to add them all up. And after the loop is finished, well, we're going to enter a zero to, to, to make the, the loop stop. Okay, we're going to enter kind of strangely worded. I would think I would have said enter an integer or zero to quit. Personally, I think would be a bit better, but it's the same idea. <clears throat> so when we enter a zero, it'll stop the loop <clears throat> because that's what the condition is. While the data is not equal to zero, keep the loop going. As soon as it is equal to zero, the loop's going to stop and we'll see what the sum is. So it's a, just a little addition program. When you get right down to it, that's all it is. So I'll go with uh, 22, 33, 12, 15, and now I'll stop the loop. And apparently those numbers add up to 82. So it's a little addition program. Pretty good example of a while loop. And in this case, data, we, we would call data a sentinel. Data, data, the data variable here is a sentinel. We're watching out for it to have a value of zero. Hope you're okay with that. Let's go back to the uh, document. Uh, here's another exercise. We want to write a, an interactive program that asks the user to enter a number and then displays the square root of the number accurate to three decimal places. The program should continue until the user enters zero or a negative number. If the user does, the program should terminate and we want to use a sentinel. Uh, you know what, I'm going to change this to just be enter zero. We'll forget about the negative number part. So zero will be the sentinel. And when the user enters zero, it, it should stop. So let's give that a try. And it doesn't say it here, but we're going to use a while loop because that's all we've studied at this point. So uh, I actually have that one already done up here. It's exercise three. And uh, here's how that might go. I created a variable called flag, and that's that's going to be my my sentinel variable. That's the value I, I, I'm going to look for. I'm going to watch out for. So I, I set it to zero. Now we're, we're creating a scanner. We're asking the user to enter a value. We're going to get input from the user, and now. We're going to have this loop run as long as whatever the user enters is not equal to flag, which is zero. So as long as it's not zero, this loop will cycle. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the math class to get the square root of the variable n. And then we're going to print it out to three decimal places. Well, to do that, printf is what we want, right? Not system print line or system print, but printf, which means print formatted. And when you use print formatted, you use a format string and specifiers inside of it to represent variables, variable locations. So here we're going to print an integer, and here we're going to print a floating point number with three decimal places. And now, because we've got two specifiers here, we need two variables after the string inside the printf. So the n is going to go into this location the square root is going to go into this location in the printout. And then we're going to ask the user to enter another integer or zero to quit. 
So once again, we're going to be looking for that flag. If the user enters a zero, then then this will be false and that'll stop the loop. So here we go. We'll give it a run. This this one is just going to keep running until we enter zero. Uh, so I'll enter um, 222. Let's see what the heck the square root of that is. Apparently it's 14.900. Uh, I'll try 300. What's the square root of 300? 17.321. Okay. Uh, let's try something that we know. How about 49? What's the square root of 49? 7.30. So yeah. Okay. So it looks like it's working. Okay. Well, this is just a square root program that's going to keep finding square roots for us as long as we keep entering numbers other than zero. So if I try a zero, that stops the loop because this condition is now false. Okay, hope you're okay with that one. It's a good review of printf too. This prints an integer. This prints a floating point number with three decimal places. And the uh, square root function of the math class always gives you a double. So you're always gonna get a number with decimal places. Okay, once again, I hope you're okay with that. Moving pretty quickly here. I hope you're okay with that. Now, here's the second type of loop. We said there are three types of loops in this chapter. The second type, do while loops. They're kind of like while loops, but there's one important difference. They use the keyword do, and then you open a set of braces, and the while and the test condition are after the closing curly brace. And there's a semicolon at the end. I put that in red here just to really highlight it. So it's a special kind of while loop that always runs at least once. That's the whole thing with a do while loop. The code uh, flow of control enters the program here. It enters the loop here. So this, these statements are gonna run every time for sure once. But if this condition here is false, that's it. it it'll only run once. As long as this condition stays true, this will keep cycling. So we call this a post-test loop because the condition that tests the loop is at the end of it. So it always runs at least once. So it's actually very good for user input. If you wanna get some user input from the user and you know, no questions asked, you wanna get some input from the user, a do while loop is, is a good choice. And this is kind of tricky that the semicolon is right here, which tells you, this whole thing is actually one big statement in Java consisting of other statements. So Liang has an example here called test do while. Let's take a look at that. Here it is, test do while. And uh, yeah, I'll just clear up this window here. If you right click here, you can select uh, clear to clear that window up. It's nice to know if you weren't aware of that. Okay, so let's see what's going on with this one. We've got int data, int sum. So it looks like we've, we've got another accumulator here and we're gonna use scanner. We're gonna keep reading data until the input is a zero. Now look, here's the do loop. It starts right there, do, and then you open a curly brace. It's kind of weird, but these statements here are gonna execute at least once. And what they're gonna do, of course, we're gonna uh, output, enter an integer or zero to quit. That's gonna be stored in the variable called data. And we're gonna add that number onto our sum. So here's the accumulation. I'm gonna put a little comment here. Accumulation is what's happening here. <clears throat> That's where your accumulator is operating. We're adding onto the sum variable up here, the accumulator. And look at the condition is at the end, while data is not equal to zero. So this is gonna keep going until we enter a zero. So it's, it's, it's also an addition program. It's like a little adding machine. When the, when the loop finishes, we're gonna report the, the total sum. So it actually runs identically to the, that previous program, but it's a do while loop this time. So uh, I'll try, uh, try some real easy numbers so we can check the answers. I'll go 10, 20. 30 and 40, which adds up to 100. 
Once I enter zero, that stops the loop. So uh, once again, it's a, it's a type of adding machine. Do while loop, very useful. Very useful for user input. Okay. Going back to the document, I apologize if we're going a little too quickly. We can take a break if you want, just let me know. But uh, let's see, uh, we've got another exercise. Let's write a, a program that uses a do while loop to display the numbers from one to 10, all on one line of output, all on one line. Well, um, once again, I've got, I've got that done already. Here it is right here. It's pretty straightforward. I chose N as my variable name here in N and I let it be one because we're supposed to output the numbers from one to 10. And now I've got a do loop as you can see, and I'm gonna print out the value of the N variable and follow it with a space. So I'm adding a space onto the end. Notice this is print, not print line. And then I'm gonna add one onto the N variable. And here's the condition while N is less than 11. So that means it should go up to 10. So this will output the numbers from one to 10, all in one line. Actually it was a fairly, fairly simple exercise, but it's, a, it's an example, a pretty good example of a do while loop. Hope you're okay with that. Now, the third type of loop is a for loop. So we're gonna now look at the for statement in Java. Instead of the while statement, now we're gonna look at the for statement. For loops, my personal favorite. They're, they're really uh, excellent for loops when you know exactly how many times you want the loop to cycle. While loops, we don't might not necessarily know how many times we want the loop to cycle with the while loop. If, if, if the number of cycles is unknown, while loop is the way to go. But if you know how many times you do want the loop to cycle, for loop is a good choice. And it's, it, I, I gravitate to using it myself. Okay, so here's the way it works. It's a little bit different. You use the keyword for, and then you open a set of parentheses. And then you have three expressions separated by semicolons. You have an initialization expression, a test expression, so that's the Boolean test right there. And then you have a modifying expression, which modifies the value of the variable that you initialized here. And, and this could operate on just one line, but most of the time you're gonna have multiple statements and you should use braces. So most of the time you're gonna have multiple statements that you're gonna repeat. So you wanna use curly braces to enclose them. So um, we can uh, we can hop ahead a little bit here, maybe. Um, let's see what. Uh, I, guess, I guess the author doesn't have too many examples for us, so um, we will uh, take a look at uh, at this in the in the document. Strangely, you can omit expressions in for loops, any, uh, any or all of the three expressions can be omitted, but there will always be two semicolons inside the parentheses. For example, you could just do this, for open parentheses, put two semicolons in, and what that does is that makes an infinite loop by design, an intentional infinite loop. Okay, an endless loop on purpose because there's, there's no test, there's no, uh, no condition that's gonna make it stop. And this is gonna just keep running. But usually if you're gonna do something like this, and sometimes it's a good strategy, by the way, to do this, make an intentional loop on purpose. What you have to do is you gotta have some code in here that's eventually gonna make the loop stop. Otherwise you got a problem. And we're gonna show you how to do that. You've got two ways to go when you make a for loop. Uh, most of the time, 
And let me just fire up a, re a really simple e example here. Um, I'm just going to add one to my my personal examples there. So I'm going to just make a new program, and I'm just going to call it to uh, for looper. And I suppose I should uppercase that L if I follow the Java policy for class names. Select my main method, hit finish. So it's called for looper. And here's the way you start a for loop. You just type the keyword for, open a set of round parentheses. Then usually you use i as a variable and you use an integer. So I'm gonna go with int i equals, I'm gonna start at zero. We don't have to, but we can start at anything we want. And then a semicolon. Now I wanna put in the test condition that's gonna make this loop stop. I less than 12, semicolon. And I wanna add one onto I in every loop iteration. So I put plus plus, I plus plus that is, at the end of the loop, and then open and close the curly brace. So here's a loop that's going to run, starting with I having an initial value of zero. I is gonna go up to, just less than 12, going up by one each time. So it's gonna increment by one each time. Now, what the heck can I do with a loop like that? Well, not too much, unless I add quite a bit of code in here, but I could just go with the system.print and I'll print the I variable plus a space after it. Just something really simple like that. That'll print the I variable inside the loop. Let's see what we get. Here we go. Goes from zero to 11. I see you're getting some help there, uh, Ruben. Okay, got a young budding coder there, helping you out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I hope you're, you're okay with why this program runs the way it does. You see, we started I, with a value of zero. It's gonna continue uh, as long as I is less than 12. And you can see it did stop at 11. And we're adding one onto I each time. Now it doesn't have to be this way. I could have started it at 10. And maybe I'd like to go up to uh, maybe less than or equal to 100 perhaps. And maybe I'd like to go up by 10. So I would say I plus equals 10 here. I plus equals 10. And by the way, it's probably a little bit easier to read if you put spaces on both sides of that operator. So now we're gonna go from 10 up to 100 by tens. And we're gonna include 100. I don't have less than 100. I got less than or equal to 100. So let's see what I get this time. I get from 10 to 100 by tens. We could go backwards with the for loop. I could start at 1000 and I could go backwards, in which case I'd have to use a greater than here instead of less than. I could go all the way down to zero and include the zero by using greater than or equal to zero. And what I could do is I could subtract each time. I could subtract uh, maybe 100 each time. So let's see what happens. So I've got minus equals 100 this time. So that's how we're gonna modify the value of i. It's gonna go down by 100 in each iteration, starting with the 1000 and stopping at zero. So as you might expect, we're gonna get that for the output from 1000 down to zero. So you've got really great flexibility. You have the initialization expression, followed by a semicolon. Then you have the test expression. This is what's gonna determine if the loop keeps going. And then here you have the modification expression, which modifies this variable over here so that the loop eventually finishes. Otherwise you got an endless loop. But that's the great thing about a for loop, no danger of an endless loop in a for loop, unless you do it on purpose with just two semicolons. Okay.
So I hope you're okay with that. For loops are great. Now there's one variant here. I'm initializing the variable i inside the loop, right inside the for expression. It is also possible to do something like this. Int i equals, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make it the same loop. I'll just put the thousand in here. But then if I do that, you'll notice I'm getting a complaint here because I'm redeclaring my i variable. I've already declared it. Well, I can't redeclare it with the same name. But what I could do uh, is just say i equals zero without redeclaring it. Okay, so here I really don't need to give it a value. I could just say int i up here. There's the declaration of the variable. And here's where I do the assignment. Now, the advantage of doing this is the final value. Uh, we, we can access the value i outside of the loop. The, the earlier programs that we looked at with the for loop, the i variable is only, variable, only available inside the loop itself. But by declaring the loop control variable outside of the loop before it, it's also available after the loop. So it might be interesting to see what the final value is here. Let's, let's check it out. Let's just, just print out the value of the variable i. Uh, I guess what we'll do is we'll throw in a, a blank print here to finish the line. Remember, we're not finishing the line up here because we've just had print. So I'll just put a blank print line that, that's, that'll finish the line. And then here I'll just print the value of i after the loop is finished. And let's see what we get. Yeah, so it goes all the way down to zero as, as before. But look at the final value. See, that's what makes the loop stop. It's not greater than or equal to zero anymore. It's, it's less than zero, it's 100 or minus 100. That's the final value of i. But it's available outside of the loop. If I tried to print i in, in some of those earlier versions that we had here, I would, I would get an error message. In fact, I'll just do control Z multiple times to get back to an earlier version there that we had. Okay, like say right there. If I try to print right here, if I try to print um, the variable I, I'm gonna get an error message. Not to mention the fact that I, it's gonna print on the same line if I, if I don't put an extra print in here. But look, right here it says, I cannot be resolved to a variable. At this point, referring to i right here, i is, is not visible to the program. i is only visible inside this loop, only in here. Now I could do lots of other things. I mean, I only got a single statement here. I could do many things inside this loop. Quite commonly, you have dozens, maybe even hundreds of statements inside of a loop. In fact, if you're playing a game, a video game, most video games run inside of a game loop. And, and those games consist of tens of thousands of lines or more. They're very complex as I'm sure you know. But notice I cannot get at this variable here. If I initialize it inside the loop, it's only visible inside the loop. Hope we've made that point. And actually that you're gonna see that right here. That's what this is all about. This way is easier, it's recommended, unless you need the variable later in your code, because it's not visible outside the loop if you do it that way. Well, uh, I'm gonna carry on here. Um, commas in four statements. This is kind of strange when you see it the first time, but both the initialization and modify an expression may have commas and refer to other variables, which seems kind of strange. But here's a good example right here. Here's a, a program called loop for, which I've just put into the uh, Word document here, but we should be able to copy that and paste it into Java, so into Eclipse. So I'm gonna do that. I'm just gonna copy that code right there. And I'm gonna paste it into this uh, project here. So I'm gonna make a new, a new program called loop for capital L and capital F. 
It doesn't really matter if I put anything in here because I'm going to overwrite it. So I'll just paste it right here. And I'll have a problem because I'll have a duplicate package statement. So I got to get rid of that. So I'll just get rid of that. And then it should be OK. So as you can see, uh, I was able to copy it in successfully and paste it in. And uh, let's see. Uh, look, look at look at the for loop this time. For int i equals zero, j equals ten, comma after it here. Here's the semicolon. So that's the entire initialization expression with two variables. This is going to keep going while i is less than ten less than or equal to 10. But look, we also have two modifying expressions here. We're going to increment the value of i, but we're going to decrement the value of j. We're going to reduce it by one in each loop iteration. OK, so this is something that you can do. And then we're going to print out the value of i and j as this cycles. So you get an interesting result. You'll see the, uh, the value of. Oh, we got an error message here. No, we're good. Um, the value of i goes from 0 up to 10. The value of j goes from 10 down to 0. You might have a need to do that in a program. And you can if you want. Now, I've just got two. You can have as many variables as you wanted here. You could have another variable. Call it what you want. I use J because it's the next one in the alphabet. If I were going to add a third one, I'd probably use K. And that's commonly done. And you'll see that in, uh, in the literature, possibly online or in other Java textbooks. I, J, and K are, are commonly used. I for iteration, right? The, the reason that we use the variable I is it's a short form for iteration, which means loop cycle. OK, so that's our introduction to uh, for loops. And we can do amazing things with them. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's see, which, which kind of loops do you use? Which loop, which loop do you want to use? Well, there's one time when you should use a while loop, for sure. And that is when you do not know for sure how many times a loop is going to cycle at the get-go. So when you're starting your program, if it's unclear how many times the loop has to cycle, for loop is not going to work because a for loop always runs a certain number of times. While loop could be used when we don't know how many times the loop has to cycle. I Myself, if I know how many times the loop is going to cycle, I, I tend to use a, a for loop. You could do it with a while loop, though, too. However, the danger with the while loop is you might get an endless loop. So I tend to gravitate towards for loops unless I have to use a while loop. Now, there's one more concept, and that's the concept of nested loops, where we have loops within loops. And it's not unusual in computer programming that you have loops within loops within loops. Um, I once wrote a timetable in program uh, for the college where I used to work. And I had to loop through every day of the week, then through every hour of the day in which classes were scheduled. Then I had to loop through uh, instructor schedules and the courses they were teaching and try to make up a timetable. Loops within loops within loops, not unusual in computer programming. You have an outer loop and multiple inner loops, sometimes just one inner loop, sometimes uh, nested several layers deep. They're great for tables, for printing or displaying tabular data. Uh, a good example is multiplication table. Let's take a look at that. And Liang's got that for us here. Here it is, multiplication table. So let's check this out. Got a, a title here, multiplication table, which is being spaced over with some spaces here. Ugh, that's pretty crude, but uh, I guess it's going to work. Then we're going to print some spaces here, which is kind of weird. But at this point, I guess uh, Dr. Liang's given us a break on difficulty. Now, here's where we're going to actually use a loop to print the table. And as you can see, we've got a for loop here using the variable i. And then here's another for loop nested. Notice it's tabbed in. So it's inside the other for loop. And notice we're using the variable j this time. 
and we're going to use printf, and we're going to display the result of i times j in a column four characters wide. That's what that 4D means, percent 4D. This, remember, this is printf, and percent specifier with a D means you're going to print an integer. The 4 means the column width. So when we run this, we get a really nice table, a uh, multiplication table, which is outstanding. If you want to know what seven times six is, we just see where seven and six intersect in the table. Or if you'd like, you could do seven times six this way, and get your 42. So this is a really great little table for uh, learning your multiplication tables up to nine by nine. If you have a younger sibling or someone in your family who's just learning their multiplication tables, run this program, snip it out for them, right? Use your snip. You know how to use your snip. I guess the snipping tool is uh, changing its name now, but if you if you type in just, uh, I'm not sure where that disappeared on me. I guess I, I guess I erased it, we'll try it again. If I just see if I can get away with it over here. If I type SN for snip, I can get my snipping tool. And if I select new, I get a set of crosshairs and I can try to snip this out. And if I had a younger sibling or a family member that was just learning their multiplication tables, I would print that out and uh, tape it to the headboard of their bed so they could memorize their multiplication tables. Great idea. Okay. All the way up to nine times nine, right here. Okay. A very interesting use of nested loops. Look at that amazing output. This one always gives me a buzz. Look at that terrific output. We got columns and rows beautifully printed out with just this code here. This finishes each line. These Notice these are just printfs. This has to finish the line so that the outer loop can start again. But I mean, look at that. That's all of just that there generates the, the table. Amazing. Programmers love working with loops. So uh, here's a little exercise. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to try this one. This is a good little exercise to see if you can do. You can use a backslash T to uh, try to space it out into columns, backslash T for tab. And um, uh, here, here's here's a here's one that I would like to try with you. Number seven. Let's see if we can use a while loop to generate Pythagorean triplets. No number being greater than one hundred, and we'll just print twenty five of them out to the screen. And what's a Pythagorean triplet? Values that can make a right angle triangle. Three, four, five. You might know. From, from math class. If you have a right angled triangle and uh, the, the two sides that are not the hypotenuse are three and four respectively, well, the hypotenuse is gonna be five. Three squared is nine plus four squared is 16. Nine plus 16 is 25. Square root of 25 is five. So three, four, five makes a right angled triangle. That's very well known to carpenters and tradesmen who wanna check the angles that they're uh, creating when they're trying to create something vertical like like say this, let's say they're trying to make a vertical wall, they'll measure four feet up the wall and three feet out this way, then measure this distance. And if it's five, they can be pretty sure they've got a vertical wall. And of course they have tools for that anyway, like levels and squares, right? But you, you can do it with Pythagoras too. Well, there's uh, another, here's another Pythagorean triplet, five, 12 and 13. 5 squared 25, 12 squared 144, add those up, you get 169, and 13 times 13 is 169, so that's another triplet. So let's create random numbers with the math class and see if we can generate these Pythagorean triplets. Now it sounds, sounds pretty challenging, 
But I've actually got this one done and I thought I'd show it to you because it's pretty cool. Here's all we got to do. While count is less than 25, we got a count variable here because we're going to make 25 triplets. So while count is less than 25, I'm going to generate three random numbers, side one, side two, and the hypotenuse, all the same way. These are going to range from one to 100. This is going to have a maximum value of 99, and we add one onto it. So this is, could be from one to 100 every one of these numbers. Now, what's the test for the Pythagorean theorem? Well, you know it very well. If the hypotenuse squared is equal to the sums of the other two sides squared, then we've got a right angle triangle. So we'll print out the hypotenuse and the two sides uh, separated by commas. Then since we found uh, a triplet, we'll add one onto the count. And when the count gets up to 25, this loop should stop. Now, I thought that would be interesting as well to see how many times it fails to find a triplet with these three numbers, because this is a pretty, pretty lousy algorithm that we're using here to find these triplets. There, no doubt there's a much better way of doing this, but uh, let's see how many times it fails to get a, a triplet. So here we go. There's 25 Pythagorean triplets. We got 25 of them, but 300 and almost 320,000 times the three numbers that we generated did not make a triplet, a Pythagorean triplet. But some of them are, are pretty staggering. Like, uh, oh, I don't know, who, who would guess this makes a right angled triangle? Quite interesting. At least I thought so. Look at this one. Here's another one, a weird one. 89, 80, and 39 makes a right angle triangle. Who knew? OK, so that turned out that that program really wasn't that hard, just based on the theory of Pythagoras. And we threw a counter in there using a while loop. Let's. Uh, See what else is coming up. Oh, uh, never use floating point numbers or doubles. Don't, don't use floats or doubles when you're uh, creating uh, for loops or while loops, okay? Because you get approximation errors if you do that. So it's true that. I really just wanted to say it's true, which means avoid that. And, and Liang finishes up with a couple more examples here. I encourage you to try those on your own time, but maybe we can wrap this up here. There's two more concepts, and that's the break, break statement and the continue statement. The break statement will immediately halt an executing loop, immediately stop it. So you would need that if you made uh, a, an infinite for loop. Remember back, back here, we showed you that you could make a, an endless for loop on purpose like this with two semicolons. Well, if you want to somehow stop that loop, you're going to have to use the break statement to stop that loop. And you would do that based on some condition. So that it'll stop the loop. But you can also break out of a loop that's not an endless loop when something happens. You can create several exit points for a loop by using the break statement. And of course, you're going to use an if selection to, to get that done. And the other keyword that is, works with loops is the continue statement. It will skip the rest of the statements in a loop and start the next iteration if, if that condition is still true. It's possible that skipping the remaining statements in a loop would be happening in the final iteration. But it, it basically, you skip the, 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 uh, the rest of the statements in the loop. Uh, we've got two examples we can take a look at, test break and test continue here from Dr. Liang's examples. Here's test break. Let's see what's going on here. We've got a while loop. We've got an, an accumulator called sum. And while number is less than 20, it starts off at zero. We're gonna add one onto it. And then we're gonna add that number onto the sum. So we're gonna be adding up numbers uh, from zero up to, uh, 
to 20, I guess. And if the sum is greater than 100, however, we're going to break out of the program. So I don't think it's going to go through all the cycles that it might go through because the sum is going to be over 100 well before all of these cycles execute. So let's see what we get from the output here. Yeah, it's, it stops at 14. It doesn't get close to 20. See, number starts at zero and goes up by one every time. And when it gets to 14, the total of zero plus one plus two plus three plus four, et cetera, all the way up to 14, I guess, makes 100. So that stops the loop. The loop breaks. That stops the loop completely. And I guess it adds up to 105 at that point. Okay, so that's what the break statement does. It just immediately stops the loop. Now we also have a test continue, which demonstrates how the continue statement look, uh, works out. The very similar program, everything's the same, except we have the keyword continue here. And a slightly different condition here. If the number equals 10 or the number equals 11. So in this case, this is the or operator, double pipe uh, symbol. That's above the shift key, uh, pardon me, above the enter key on your keyboard. You have to shift to get it. So if number is equal to 10 or number is equal to 11, we're, going to, we're not going to add it on to the sum. It won't get added on to the sum. Okay. So that's the way this one's going to work. So let's see what happens when we run it. So apparently the sum is only 189. It doesn't add all the numbers up. Uh, I think it'd be kind of cool if we printed the, the number here, by the way. So I think I'll throw that in here. Um, right here, we'll do system of dot print line and try to print. Hmm, that's weird. Oh, I guess I've blown up my system of that print line. So I'll have to type it in. I'll go with print line. And what I'll do is I'll just print out the number variable. Because I think this will be instructive uh, when we give this a run. So let's see what we get here. Oh, I probably would have been better with print. Let's save some screen real estate. So I'll actually do print and I'll append. I'm having trouble with my keyboards acting up here. I'll try a plus a space just to separate them by space. So, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No 10 and no 11. See, they were left out. Continue. As soon as we got to continue, these statements here were skipped and the loop started over again at the next higher number. So, so it jumps to 12. We don't, we don't get 10 or 11. Okay. Sometimes you'll, you'll need that, continue. Just means skip all the statements remaining in the loop and start the next cycle. And quite frankly, that's, that's uh, really all we need to know about this chapter, I think. Uh, Dr. Liang has a couple more examples that you can test. Um, there's a palindrome that you can do. That's kind of an interesting one, actually. We'll take a look at it. It only takes a second. Test palindrome. Uh, let's just call it palindrome. <clears throat> so let's take a look at it. If we give it a run. Uh, let's see what the test is. While low is less than high. Low has a value of zero. High is the string length uh, minus one. So 
uh, what they're doing here is uh, going through the, str the string character by character and seeing if, if it's the same reversed as it is in regular order. Uh, well, a good example of a palindrome is a race car because it's the same backwards and forwards. So program works okay. So that's about it folks for, for this chapter. I hope you're okay with it. Um, you, you might, I, I strongly encourage you to go through my examples as well. Um, I've got nine of them here that uh, you can see uh, the so-called instructors zipped examples. And I think it's worth going through them. So for some more examples that'll help you with your assignment. So good luck and have a great uh, holiday weekend. I think we can knock it off a little bit early tonight unless somebody wants to stay for some particular reason. I think we can call it an evening. Okay, thank you. Okay. How are you? Are you, are you okay with that, Ruben? Uh, yeah, can we actually look at the, um, the one with that chart again, the multiplication table? Uh, yeah, that was, that was called... Uh, what was it called? Multiplication table. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. I'm ultimately what I'm trying to figure out is when you run it is how you get that column going down. Um, out that print I plus the um, the straight line. Like I see it there, but I'm just trying to figure out how he actually gets it just to run straight down. Um. Well, actually. That just on, that just prints a horizontal. 18. That yeah, uh, eighteen. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, well, that that's the pipe symbol, which is above your enter key if you hit shift. That's that's all that is. So like, if I if I hit that key shift enter on my keyboard, so I'll get pipe symbol. I, I understand that part, but whenever yeah. you actually run the program, it yeah. it goes vertical. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's going to print out the way it looks. Yeah, that's that's what that does. But it see it's repeating in each line. Each line is printing that, and so line line by line, line after line, it looks like a vertical line through the whole thing. Just because I was thinking with the uh, the print line, right or the, just the print function that it would run. Um, this is what that's her right. That's it printing right here, right down the left. Yeah, looks like a line, but it's not. As you can see, it's not really continuous. This is the horizontal line produced by this statement. Uh, frankly, you can leave it out. In my opinion, in my opinion, I, I would just uh, I would just print this much. If I were doing this for somebody. Uh, I think I would leave the multiplication table in and I would take, um, I would think I would take everything out except the table body, frankly. So let's see what happens if I do that. I'll take, and I don't even like the need, to, I don't see what we need this for. So if I, if I comment that out and <laughs> That's a Python comment. If I comment that out and also comment all this code out, except for the multiplication table, perhaps. So if I comment that out with uh, source add block comment, that'll get rid of all that. And uh, if I just run this much here, I think I get what, what's important, which is the which is the columns and the rows. That's really what, that's what I would print for uh, somebody in my family or to help somebody learn the multiplication tables. And of course you could take it up to 12 times 12, which would, uh, I think if I remember rightly, that's what the uh, little workbooks that we got in elementary school did. If you take it up to 12 times 12, then you'll get uh, an even better all, all the way up to 144. Maybe 4D doesn't work out as well. It gets a little jammed here. So you might want to try 5D. 
let the columns be five characters wide instead of four. Yeah, and then you got a pretty good multiplication table. What's nine times 12? 108. And it's, it's great to, to memorize these. If you memorize these, it'll help you out with your mathematics all through your life. Hope that helps. Is that what you were talking about, uh, Ruben? Yeah, it was just that, um, yeah, line 18. Okay. Or whatever line it was. Yeah, okay. All right then, well, uh, we're done folks. Have a, have a great uh, holiday weekend coming up. Labor Day weekend. Be safe though. Arthur, Be safe you. out there. Take care. I'm gonna sign off now. Brad out. <laughs>